Northwestern medicine investigators were the first to show that microglial expression of a gene signature indicative of disease-associated microglia, or DAM, correlates with the severity of hippocampal and cerebellar-associated behavioral deficits in a neuropsychiatric symptoms of systemic lupus model prior to overt systemic disease. While DAM have been extensively studied in Alzheimer's disease, no studies have specifically examined DAM in NPSLE until now. Welcome to Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm Melanie Cole, and joining me is Dr. Carla Kuda. She's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at Northwestern Medicine. Dr. Kuda, thank you so much for joining us today. And before we get into your research, speak a little bit about the prevalence of neuropsychiatric symptoms in lupus patients. And what are some of the most neuropsychiatric symptoms that we're talking about here today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. So to kind of go back, systemic lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease that can affect multiple organ systems, including the renal, cardiovascular, and nervous systems, among others. And though the cause is unknown, genetic predisposition, epigenetics, environmental factors, viruses, or infections have been shown to potentially play a role in disease. And so patients will experience variable manifestations of lupus with differing organ systems affected. And any combination of criteria that will total 10 points in conjunction with a positive anti-nuclear antibody test will render a diagnosis of lupus according to a new classification system that just came out in 2019. So involvement of the nervous system is referred to as neuropsychiatric symptoms of lupus or NPSLE, as mentioned before. And so similar to lupus in general, NPSLE is highly variable in patients and can involve both the peripheral and or the central nervous systems. So MPSLE can affect anywhere between 12 to 95% of SLE patients, depending on the attribution model. And so this wide range in prevalence in the literature is seemingly due to the highly subjective nature of the diagnostic criteria. So these facts in combination with the list of somewhat nonspecific symptoms makes MPSLE really difficult to diagnose. And so in my lab, we're focusing on NPSLE of the central nervous system, which can then be subdivided into two syndromes, focal or diffuse. The focal syndrome includes symptoms like seizures, movement disorders, headaches, while the diffuse syndrome includes symptoms like anxiety disorder, mood disorder, psychosis, and cognitive impairment. So as you can see, these are really not specific to NPSLE, but the fact that these would be occurring in conjunction with systemic lupus is what really makes it an NPSLE diagnosis. So the literature seems to suggest that damage associated with the central nervous system and the renal system accounts for the majority of lupus-attributed morbidity and mortality. Thus, we feel there's really a critically unmet need to interrogate NPSLE and its underlying mechanisms to improve patients' health-related quality of life. Wow, this is really interesting. Dr. Kuda, so your research focuses on understanding the underlying immunologic mechanisms of lupus. Is this a relatively new area of research? I'd like you to please provide a brief overview of your research and why this is so important that we're doing this now. So as I mentioned before, it's really hard to diagnose it, but even more challenging in the field is really understanding the underlying mechanisms of disease in some cases, especially for diffuse NPSLE, which is really what our lab focuses on. So numerous mechanisms have been proposed, but my lab is focusing on immune cell-mediated inflammation as a causative factor of NPSLE. And we particularly emphasize our research on the role that microglia play in disease pathogenesis. So microglia are a brain-resident macrophage-like cell that help to maintain homeostasis in the brain through various functions, including surveillance, phagocytosis, which means chopping up cells, and then synapse pruning, which will keep things clean in the brain. However, when you have aberrant microglial functions, any of these processes go awry, this can lead to dyshomeostasis. So for example, the inflammatory response that's mediated by activated microglia plays a major role in neuronal cell death and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So we are focusing our efforts on studying this heterogeneous population of cells in the context of NPSLE. So you recently published findings in Frontiers in Immunology that you presented at the ACR annual meeting last November regarding that role of microglia in NPSLE. Can you tell us specifically about that work and the methods that you used? Yes, of course. So the investigation into microglia is relatively new. I would say maybe within the past five years, there was 
previous literature which seemed to suggest that there was, based on postmortem brain biopsies, that there was activation of microglia. But this is all really difficult to grasp because you're looking at sections of tissue and really no functional data. So in our lab, we utilize multiple mouse models of lupus that will also display NPS allele-like disease and that they will show deficits when put through behavioral tasks for things like anxiety, memory, motor coordination, or fear response. And what's interesting is that these behavioral tasks are also designed to implicate affected brain regions, which is even more cool because then you can hone in on looking at particular populations of cells within that region that's affected. So we can then isolate microglia from brains of these mice and obtain gene expression signatures using either bulk or single cell RNA sequencing technology to evaluate potential functional changes that occur with disease. So one of our recent and impactful findings that we just published in Frontiers a few years ago is that microglia from multiple models of MPSLE express a common signature that we call an NPSLE signature. And in addition to that, they also express genes associated with this recently discovered dam population thought to be critical in Alzheimer's disease. And so this particular microglia subset has been shown to localize around amyloid beta plaques to aid in plaque clearance through phagocytic functions. And further, so when we looked at how these signatures are expressed in the microglia, the extent of expression actually correlates with the severity of behavioral deficits in young lupus-prone mice. So it really makes us believe that this population and potentially the dam subset are really critical for either tracking disease or possibly contributing to disease pathogenesis. This is so interesting. So what are your more recent findings? Are your new findings any different from what's currently available? Tell us a little bit about some of the meaningful endpoints of your study. Yeah, so our new findings. So we're the first really to look at DAM in the context of lupus. There's maybe a one or two other articles that even sort of mention what's happening here. And so we really go in depth into looking at this population in our new data set. So First of all, we're the first to show that an established model of lupus previously unexplored for MPSLE-like disease actually exhibits heightened anxiety and defects in motor coordination early in life. And what's really great about this is that the more models that we have that mimic certain aspects of human disease, the better that we can then try to pinpoint the underlying mechanisms of each of these symptoms, because one can assume that what causes anxiety may not cause psychosis. So the fact that we have models now which display certain aspects of human diseases is really great. And so this anxiety and motor coordination defects and impairments in these issues will actually implicate the amygdala and the cerebellum and mirror defects that are observed in lupus patients exhibiting NPSLE. So using single-cell RNA sequencing technology, we profiled the heterogeneity of microglia early and late in life and were able to identify the dam population at both early and late time points in NPSLE as well as control strains of mice. And so looking specifically at the dam, we've seen an expansion of this population in aged NPSLE-prone mice. When we look at what genes change in the NPSLE dam compared to control dam, we find that genes involved in antigen processing and presentation in the context of MHC1 as well as the response to type 1 and type 2 interferon are upregulated in NPSLE DAM. And so similar to our data mentioned before, we also find that phagocytic functions may be depleted in DAM of our NPSLE prone mice, which is in contrast to DAM in neurodegenerative disease. So in DAM in Alzheimer's disease, phagocytic functions are actually upregulated, but we're finding this is dampened in our NPSLE DAM. And so interestingly, though, even at a young age, the e-genes involved in the antigen processing and presentation in the context of MHC1 and the response to type 2 interferon are already upregulated in MPSLE DAM. So already at a very early time point prior to this mouse experiencing systemic lupus at really any great degree, there's already something happening in the microglia in the brain, which is also corresponding to behavioral deficits, particularly anxiety. So when we compared time points within each strain, we also find that the dam are more enriched for the dam signature with age than control dam. So these data and other data not mentioned here suggests that dam not only are elevated in numbers, they actually fully differentiate into more of a dam-like cell and that maybe this is a pathogenic population in NPSLE. And so again, this is also in contrast to their proposed protective role in early development of Alzheimer's disease. So what we find, too, is that these patterns hold true in another model of NPSLE that we study in the lab, suggesting that these are truly penetrant defects in multiple models of NPSLE-like disease. So this is really cool to us because always when you can validate with another model, it really only concretely provides a mechanism that you can hold on to. 
So switching gears, positron emission tomography or PET analysis has been widely used to assess brain function and metabolism through the use of a glucose analog radio tracer. So this is what's commonly referred to as FDG PET. So however, this is relatively nonspecific in terms of understanding the cells that are involved. So in recent years, numerous tracers have been developed to target other biologically relevant pathways. In particular, there's been tracers that have been developed that target mitochondrial translator protein, or TSPO, and so I'll use that going forward. And so these radio tracers have been used to detect activated microglia in both patients and animal models of other diseases as levels of TSPO will increase with activation. And so then you can expect increased radio tracer uptake in areas where you have microglial activation. So we utilized a novel tracer targeting TSPO developed in the Center for Translational Imaging in conjunction with, I believe, the University of Chicago, and saw an increased tracer uptake in our NPSLE microglia in our models, indicating increased microglial activation. And what was really cool was that this was really in the cerebellum and potentially the amygdala, and this coincides then nicely with our behavioral testing implicating defects in these particular regions in this mouth. So when we look within each microglial subset, again, going back to our single cell data, we find that the dam cluster of cells is the only population of microglia in the NPSLE prone strain with a significant increase in the expression of TSPO. So these data suggest that DAM might be the source of the elevated TSPO detected by PET analysis in the brain regions impacted by disease, which is really cool for us. It is really cool, and this is such important work you're doing with far-reaching implications. So as we're talking about the neuropsychiatric symptoms of lupus, how do you feel your research impacts patient care? How do you feel it might impact physicians' treatment of lupus patients further down the line? Take us from bench to bedside. So in the field, and especially within the clinic, there are very few diagnostic criteria or targetable mechanisms, whether it be pathogenic cell populations or proteins. Generally, diagnosis is occurring through eliminating everything else, and then you end up with a diagnosis of NPSLE. So what we're hoping is that our research will expand our knowledge base to potentially provide information to be able to develop improved diagnostics and treatment strategies. And again, whether we can find a population of cells that's pathogenic that we can detect potentially maybe in the cerebral spinal fluid of patients or proteins in this same area, or maybe this is even something we can translate into the serum of patients so that we don't have to get CSF from these people, that we can find either an improved diagnostic measure or potentially a targetable mechanism that can be then used for enhanced treatment strategies. So specifically when we're thinking about imaging, so imaging for diagnostics, So the PET imaging for TSPO levels and microglial activation has only recently been piloted in cognitively impaired lupus patients. I believe there's maybe only one or two studies out there. So though this is a promising tool potentially to interrogate microglial activation in MPSLE patients, more work will still need to be done to verify its utility as a diagnostic tool. But I think we're on the way. What a great interview. And as we wrap up, do you have anything you'd like to tell other providers what's next for you when it comes to this area of study or what you would like them to know are the key takeaways from this podcast? So, yeah, I think we are trying at the bench side here, trying to figure out what is an underlying cause. And I think it's really difficult to dissect, but I'm hoping from this podcast that it will be taken away that potentially microglia are a root cause, something happening early in disease, prior to any contributions of systemic involvement. This has always been the issue with lupus is that what comes first? Does the systemic disease cause potentially a breakdown in the blood-brain barrier, which then leads to infiltration of either a cell type or a circulating meteor that affects the brain? Or is the brain itself already having changes early on, which then contribute to having these manifestations occur. And what's interesting, too, is that sometimes the neuropsychiatric manifestations predate actual lupus diagnosis. So, you know, they'll give a patient diagnosis of lupus and find out that years earlier there was some event which potentially was the first start of their lupus. So I think these pieces of information that are in the literature and scattered throughout lead us to believe that there's probably something happening within the brain, potentially within microglial populations. And because we're never going to get brain biopsies from patients, and we understand that, we have to utilize these mouse models in as many ways as possible to dissect out disease pathogenesis. And so we hope to get buy-in from providers to see if we can collect samples from patients if possible. 
to really try to move what we find in the mouth model to patients. And that's what we hope, the gold standard. (laughs) Thank you so much, Dr. Kuda, for joining us. And I hope you'll come on again and update us as things progress in your research. Thank you again. And to refer your patient or for more information, please visit our website at breakthroughsforphysicians.nm.org slash room. That's R-H-E-U-M to get connected with one of our providers. And that concludes this episode of Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm Melanie Cole.